Very good. So we have been talking about um, pedestrian networks and public spaces on campus for the last maybe three weeks. And today we're gonna do a little bit of details. Um, this is actually where we are having, um, do you remember what we were talking about when there is a contour? And, and the, these are the contour lines, like this is lowest and this is highest in this segment which is 63, 64, 65, 66, 67. We said something about, uh, about these pedestrian walks and we said it's much better if we have the uh, pedestrian walks in the direction of the uh, contour lines. Like if these are the contour lines going that way, our pedestrian walks should go actually like that either parallel or tilted, but in the same direction. I mean, this can be also a pedestrian walk. What's the problem of having something across the, um, the topographic lines? Issue is when you do it like that, and you have like, this is like between 67 and 63. You, you will have a very steep pedestrian walk. I think we talked about this uh, before, but actually when you are working on a pedestrian system, you need to work with topography, meaning that it's much better if you have it like parallel to the contour lines, if they are that simple. Uh, or uh, actually, um, a little bit tilted. So if you have something like that, like contour lines in that direction, and you need to create a pedestrian walk, it's much better if you do it like either directly parallel. Parallel means what? Parallel means that the pedestrian walk from start to end will be on the same level. So actually it will be kind of leveled all the way from this point to that point, it's kind of leveled. It's lower than this line and it's higher than this line, but here level, something like that, it's all level. If you do it a little bit tilted like that, then it's not really level, but you will face a situation where you, you have to adjust the, the, the slope. If you do it perpendicular, this is the slope. If you would do it tilted, maybe this will be the slope, but if you do it parallel, this will be the slope. Nothing, I mean, there's no slope. It's almost leveled. Uh, you cannot see that. I was saying that if you do it between the 67, 63, just perpendicular, it will be very steep pedestrian walk. If you do it something like that, tilted on the uh, topographic lines, it will be a little bit uh, slope, but not really bad. I mean, you can still have like a good percentage of slope. If you do it just parallel, it would be leveled all the way. So we usually go for, if you can, we usually go for like parallel to the uh, slope lines or the, the um, topographic lines, I'm sorry, parallel to the topographic lines or a little bit. Of. And we definitely try to avoid something like, like that, where you are almost per the uh, topographic lines, we don't do that. Okay, so if we're doing this in a, even on a, on a level thing, like between here, between the lines of 65 and 64, which is here, 65 and 64, these are the elevation lines and there is a slope and now I'm, I'm going parallel. I'm, got, I'm having the side, the pedestrian path here. And this is kind of parallel to the lines. There is still a slope, right? In the ground, but, but my sidewalk is, or path, pedestrian path is really level, but actually it goes between these two lines here. So I'm faced with something that I have to fix. How would I fix this pedestrian path 
on the slope here. I mean, the whole area is sloped, but I need to put my pedestrian path uh, on that sloped path, sloped level. What should I do here? I mean, how, how would I do that? If the land is undisturbed, it goes like that. But now I have to disturb the land to build the pedestrian wall. So I will have to remove some of the dirt from here and add something here to make it like work. So if I, if I take this off, I, I, I add something in here beneath the pedestrian wall, then it can be level. But otherwise I will have a real issue. If the slope is, is something like gentle like that, I mean, it can go like that. This is a gentle slope, but actually my pressure walk is still aligned or very steep, something like that. So what, how would I put my pedestrian walk on it? Oh, I have to connect to power. Oh, just allow me to move that forward. Okay, we're back. Very good. So actually what happens, let me um, refresh some for some of those who just joined. We are trying now to draw a pedestrian path on a sloped surface. Let me draw it again. Start from the end. And what I was Telling you is that if I have this kind of slope area between 67, I mean, uh, level lines, topography 67, 66, 65, 64, 63, it means that this is the lowest point and this is the highest. And now I'm having to put a pedestrian wall. I, I select where I draw it. So actually, if I draw it parallel to the lines, it will be the least, I mean, it will be kind of level. It goes parallel to whatever uh, topographic lines I'm having. If I'm having it a little bit tilted like that, then it's going from 66 at this point to 64 at this point. So it's kind of slope, it goes down. If it is like from here, 67 to 63, it would be very steep. Like if it is going from this point to that point, like perpendicular, it goes very steep, which is kind of either goes either very steep, something like that. And we said that we cannot have any pedestrian walk of more than one to 10, usually one to 10. Sometimes they do it one to eight in trails, but actually one to 10 slope is the, the most that we can have, one to 10. If it is like 
going parallel here, the slope will be zero. There's no slope. If you are going parallel here, there's no slope because it's going something like, like that. Anyway, so what happens? Now I'm having undisturbed area here. And this is my cut section in the ground. It goes like that. And I'm having maybe a building here or something. And this is the sidewalk somewhere in here, or the building is here on top. And then I'm having a sidewalk here. So for this sidewalk, I'll have to, what we call usually disturb the existing topography. Why disturb? Because when I have like, it's not really suggested or it's not really a nice good thing or acceptable even to have a sidewalk that goes like that, like it's, it's tilted. You can have a parking space for a car on a slope. You can have car movement on a slope, but for pedestrian walk, it's not really nice to have the pedestrian walk going like that. So you cannot really do this. So we usually go for a level sidewalk, something like this. And, and to do that, I will bring it in a little bit. I don't know how would I, would I do Zoom, but I will try. Uh, anyway, we don't know how to do it, but it's okay. Okay. I will maybe draw it again. Larger. So what happens here is that I'm, I'm trying to have built, construct a sidewalk on not a level site, something like that. The site is not level. So I will just draw this a little bit larger so maybe this is the slope that i'm having and the sidewalk is just something like that so how would i do it the easiest thing or the simplest thing is that you compact the soil like you go, you come here and you cut the ground so this is kind of removed and you get here and this is kind of you build it up and you just compact the soil. When you compact the soil, you can walk on it. Sometimes you do that, you compact the soil and you put a base uh, of gravel or concrete or whatever you want. So actually having a base. When you have a base, it makes the sidewalk more stable. If the rain comes, it doesn't take it away. I mean, things like that. So actually the first thing to do is to make it completely level. And we said that it's not really nice to have a sidewalk like tilted like that. So actually you will walk with your friend and he is walking on a higher ground than you. So actually it's not, it's not comfortable. You cannot do that. You don't do that. So actually this, if this is our sidewalk, it has to be completely level. And then we have to remove part of the, uh, the soil and maybe build some of the soil here, add some soil, compact it, and then we have our sidewalk. Something we do, and, we, and please take care of this when you are building on a, on a big site, something like that of AMU campus. We usually try to balance what cut from here. This is a cut dirt, and this is build up or added. Or actually, the technical term is fell. So actually, there is cut in this area and there is fill in this area. I will ask you actually to make sure that you are listening. Mackenzie, 
what do you think they do with the fill or the cut? I mean, where do they bring that fill or where did they uh, send the cut? Hello? Mackenzie, you're not here. Dana? Hello? Dana? Everett, I'm saying Everett, that. I'm saying yeah, uh, but Dana is not, not here, right? Not here, okay. Not here, okay. Everett, um, if I have to build this sidewalk in this topography, and I have to cut some on the ground and on the ground, where do you think they send this cut away or bring the fill from? I go from uh, my right or left side first. Like, I will probably, no, no, I'll take that back. Hold on. Ask the question one more time, sir. I'm confused. I will definitely try, I will to, definitely make, try to make them. I'll try to make them equal. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I but, think it'll be easier if you add on to the spot that needs a bit more depth, which would be to the right side of me. I think yeah. it'll be like you add on to the right side of me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this slope is, is going. So actually, sometimes it's not even possible to build this curve because, so they, yeah, um, go ahead. The retaining wall that's there for the- um, I, didn't, I, didn't talk about any, I didn't talk about any retaining wall, but no, actually- I, It's yeah. like right there where you have that, um, where you just added the last piece. That right there it has to be like a wall retaining that. No, no, bed. wait, wait, wait. What you're talking about is when I don't have this verb or the slope is really bad, so something like that. So actually I cannot build a berm, it doesn't work. So in this case, I will have to build a retaining wall. Why don't we start by a retaining wall? Because this is the most expensive thing you do on site is build a retaining wall. It's very expensive. And there are different forms of retaining walls to work on. But actually in, in planning, and this is kind of detailing the site, I might be able to just remove some of this, even remove some of this, and move the whole sidewalk aside like, like this. So actually I will move it inside and do more cut than I, I did before, like do this cut too, and reduce the area that I need to fill. Actually when I'm doing the berm or the rail or, you're talking now about uh, um, a retaining wall. Now it becomes possible. So it all depends on the details. All of this, this stuff is in the detail. So I can do the retaining wall here with um, different forms. And I will tell you now. And, and maybe if you can see the landscape guys working on a site, you will see that when they are digging on the site, they find maybe some boulders or maybe big rocks or whatever they, they, they find over there or stone. So what they do is just, they don't throw it away. They, they keep these stones and they start building here at the edge of their sidewalk. Here's something with the stones. So actually the stones are for the boulders or the rocks or whatever they have. They are put here so that they kind of support the edge of the sidewalk. So yes, this is a third alternative. So actually the first alternative is to build a berm, something like that of dirt. And this will be good enough if the slope is not bad and you're not having a lot of rain coming to the area. Or the second alternative will be to have the rail, handrail on the side. And this will just keep, it will be the cost of the rail, but actually you don't have to do a lot of fill in this area. And the third will be to have a, 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 a wall by the side. And walls are actually different kinds. I mean, if the slope is, is, is heavy, and I mean big, and you need to, to do like a big wall, something like that up to here, then we are talking about different ways of doing this uh, retaining wall. And the retaining wall becomes even more expensive than anything else. Uh, retaining walls can be done of stone, can be done of concrete, can be done with a mesh and then uh, a steel mesh and then having some concrete on it. They sometimes they support it inside the dirt or actually most of the time when it is something like big like this and they do what they call dead men, dead men. Dead men is like these fingers they put in the, in the dirt to keep the retaining wall from slipping. So actually it becomes a real construction project. So actually, instead of just building a sidewalk, now we are talking about a lot of cost. When it becomes um, to the rail, I mean, the berm is the, the cheapest. And then the berm, the, the, the rail is a little bit more expensive, but when it comes to that you have to support the side of your sidewalk, it becomes really expensive. We don't do that, usually we don't. So we, move our uh, sidewalks inside, uh, do more cut, and because cut is even less, it's much less expensive than having to fill, and maybe reduce the size of the fill to the minimum so that you don't have to have all of these expensive uh, alternatives. So again, I'll just draw it again.
I will have when I know the, the slope, like 67, 66, 65, 64, 63, from the lowest to the highest elevation, I will select my sidewalk to be almost parallel. So I don't have to have a steep slope to work on. And if I can't, I'll just make it lean a little bit on these. Uh, it depends definitely on, on, on the site. But actually, I can have that uh, like leaning a little bit. But I will try to avoid as much as I can to make the sidewalk perpendicular. Uh, as we have seen maybe last term for those who attended, um, maybe I can have like if I need a longer and, and less uh, sloped uh, pedestrian walk, I'll do it like this and then I will go back and then I will, I will go again. So actually a sidewalk like this expresses that you are working with the topography and you are making your slope as controlled as possible. When I'm working with the section, I think this is the section and this is the ground I'm working on, I will always do a little bit more cut than fell because fell will be risky. I'll have to have safety things like either, as you said, a handrail, a berm, or a retaining wall. And retaining walls are the most expensive with these fingers that we put in the ground to make them like not slip. So first work with the slope. Second, do more cut than fell. And as we started by saying that we have to balance them because if you do more cut than fell, then you are, you're left with a little bit more of, of the dirt to do this berm. This berm is, is included inside. So actually, plus the berm. And then avoid retaining walls if you can. Sometimes we can. If you can't avoid a retaining wall, try to work with whatever you find on the ground. Like if you find stone, boulders, rocks, you work with that. And you can build the retaining, the retaining wall with these uh, material. You don't have to have concrete or you don't have to have whatever other material, supporting material that will be expensive and, and comes to be a construction project. Safety here is very important. Got that? Mackenzie, are you still with us? Dana? Yeah, uh, she said no, no, wait, 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 wait a little bit. Dana, are you still with us? I'm still here. Okay. So I was asking about the cut and fill. And what, what did, I mean, if I'm working to create a sidewalk on this slope here, if this is the slope of the ground that I'm working on, and I have to put my sidewalk on the slope, like parallel to the slope. Uh, we said something about the cut and fill. What do you think? How would be the cut and fill? I don't understand what you're asking. Uh, did you hear my, my talking about cut and fill of the ground? Of the, yes. Of the yeah. So we usually try to do what with the cut and fill in terms of their Level volume. Out. In terms of their volume, what do we usually do? Level them out. Try to balance the cut and fill. So actually when, when we have to cut like 10 uh, cubic feet we will have to fill 10 cubic feet right so that we don't have to remove or bring anything from outside the site it's usually much better if you don't remove anything from the site or bring dirt from outside so actually we try to balance them and then as we said when when we balance them we have to take care of the edge of our sidewalk because it becomes a hazard if it extends more than necessary 
outside and have this fell. In this case, why do you think this will be a hazardous or a safety hazard? People can fall. Yes, exactly. So how do you stop people from falling? I would put a railing. That's okay. We actually talked about other alternatives. Maybe you are not hearing proper. A, a rail, handrail is one of the options. Yes, you're right. But actually, the first option that we think of is just create a little bit of a dirt berm. And the berm will be something like that. And this berm will stop people from falling and will make it very difficult for people to reach the edge. Now it's kind of something like that. And we can have also some shrubs or uh, whatever vegetation on it. So people are discouraged from going to the edge of the sidewalk. We, we do that. Uh, this is a little bit uh, of a cost, but it's a good safety measure to do is just to uh, have a berm, dirt berm. If we cannot do that and, and we don't have the space here, we just have the rail. That's what we said. And after the rail, if we cannot do that, we have to have actually kind of a, uh, in, a retaining wall to the side so that people don't really fall. It's kind of a slope thing, so people will not fall from uh, from the side. Uh, we can make this a little bit higher here. I mean, the, the retaining wall comes higher, so people walking here will not actually reach the edge of the sidewalk. And I mean, there are other details that we can use to make sure that people are safe on our sidewalk. So actually, this is in terms of construction. If we are um, doing something like that, Kaylee, uh, what, what do you think we, we need to do maybe something like that, like switch the layout of the sidewalk and bring it back? I mean, do something like this. Why we are doing this? Well, you would do that of zigzag pattern if it's too steep. If it, it's not even too steep, if it is steep at all, if you want to keep it as much leveled as possible, you just do that. Yes, you're right. Because the best thing will be to go parallel, but if I have to go from like 66 to 64, I will just cross that and then come back. And then when on this length, it will be like, it will not be too long on the, on the slope. Like it will be sloped and then it will be leveled for like an area where people can just uh, think what's happening and uh, look in what are the options for moving uh, forward or backward and then decide and then move again. So actually when we do something like this, we need, as we said in, in a network, it's kind of a link and a node and then another link. So what is happening here is that we're having this link, and this link, so we try to expand the area here and make it like a node. So I, I go here, I kind of catch my breath. I maybe I sit down, maybe I'll just look around and see what's happening. And then I will continue moving in that direction or that direction, doesn't matter. So actually when I'm having something like this on a slope, you usually find, um, a little bit of enlarged areas or what we call pocket areas, pocket spaces. Why pocket spaces? Because they are only intended for you to catch your breath, to just uh, wait for a friend who's coming down or just think.
telling me the nigga that got down her over the crab gone? Yeah. Still record. Sorry, I lost the net. Sorry, I'm doing that on campus. So I lost the net. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> let me go back. So actually, we're talking about how to build a sidewalk on a slope. How would we deal with the the topography? And we said that it's much better to be parallel or a little bit uh, uh, inclined on that. But actually, never uh, perpendicular. This is the worst thing to have if it is like too sloped, we cannot do that. If you have to, you will have to make it like what Kelly was saying, like a zigzag, something like that. So actually it takes longer and the slope can be modified. But now let's talk about something else. Okay, so now we have in our campus plan, which you will be working on again uh, for, uh, uh, this Thursday on a, on a larger, um, plan on a larger map. Now we have maybe two 
pedestrian walks crossing, or you are having the vehicular roadway, which is most of the time either two directions or one day, but all, all the time it's like two lanes. And then you're having the sidewalk on one of the sides here. And we talked last time about what would be the section, how to do that. And another one here, how would you make the crossing, like come from this sidewalk to that sidewalk on the other side? How would you do that? The way, the simplest thing is to draw lines on the, the floor. But as we said, this might not be the best way to do it. Um, it depends on what are your priorities. If your priority is for pedest safe pedestrian movement, then I will actually do something different. I will use a very wide crossing of the street. And I will make the level of the sidewalk as the same level of the crossing area. So actually, all of this area here will be on the same level. Like all of this area across the street will be on the same level. So what happened to cars? Then cars will have to stop, maybe go up, be on the same level, and then go down. If I'm doing this, this will have to be at least the size a little bit larger than the size of a car. So actually, if the car is uh, eight, nine feet, 10 feet, then this area would be at least 10 feet. The area in which you are crossing the street it will be at least 10 feet. So the car will come here and then will climb up and then will go down. Uh, why we're doing this? To make it very clear for the car that now you are entering a pedestrian area. We also want to make it comfortable to the car. So the car, the driver will, will go up, will feel that he's leveled and then will go down again. So actually we will make this um, crossing at least the size of a car, at least 10 feet, maybe 15. So actually they go up, and then they go down comfortably, it takes them a little bit of time, like in seconds, but they will feel that they are now entering the pedestrian domain. They will have to slow down. They know that the priority in this higher, higher level is for people walking on their uh, legs. So you don't speed. You cannot actually speed because if you do, the car will just jump up. You might cause an accident to yourself or to the guys around. So actually, this, is, this will be a good way of doing that. We also talked last time about what would be a good cross section. And I asked you to draw a cross section. So if this is the sidewalk here, and this is the, the vehicular movement here, we said that we need to have like at least a buffer of maybe two feet. And this two feet might have vegetation. So I will need to have vegetation on the side of the pedestrian walk here. And the pedestrian walk we said it might be from four, six, eight, ten, whatever you want. When this is the vehicular uh, movement side, we usually are good enough with like one and a half to two feet of vegetation, or at least one and a half feet of like uh, maybe road signs and other things. So here you can find uh, signs for the cars here, like this is a coming curve or stop for pedestrians or whatever you want to have and this is like between one and a half and two maybe a little bit more if you want to do that if you want to have a tree also it goes a little bit a little bit larger and then you will have the side so for safety we, we mentioned when it is a slope we need the berm the rail or the uh, retaining wall uh, on when it is leveled like that we need to have some separation a buffer maybe uh, um, a shrub, an area for signs and things, trees, and so on. So actually I'm having these here for the pedestrian walk and the, and, the, and, and, and the road. Okay, so what happens if you are having 
a pedestrian walk going like that and another pedestrian walk going like this. Like they, they have to meet in some place. First, I want to mention something that you need to be very careful about. When we're working with pedestrian walks, you have to understand that people never walk in uh, orth orthogonal, like they, they, they never walk in 90 degrees. Like you don't walk like, like that, and then you walk 90 degrees, you go this way. If you are faced with this kind of a sidewalk, you usually want to find something that connects like that. So actually, it's much better for you if you have an angle that's not 90 degrees. We usually say that try to avoid as much as possible the 90 degrees um, diversions of uh, pedestrian traffic because it's not really normal. It's not natural that you walk in 90 degrees. You usually would like to, to walk something like that. So actually, you will take if it is possible, and in this area is not blocked, you will just walk like that. So you, you walk in a slanted angle like this, and then you, you join the other side of it. So uh, first thing is, please avoid um, 90 degree intersections or orthogonal uh, connections between uh, pedestrian walks. This is very important. You have to avoid orthogonal uh, intersections. If I have to do something like this, like 90 degrees, I will enlarge the area where these two sidewalks actually come together and then make this, as we said here, it might be a pocket space. And this might be a space here, uh, whether large or small, but you need something when two sidewalks meet. You need to have an area where people can stop, think about what they're doing, and then move. We usually equate a link and a node in a network as move and stop signs. Like if it is like elongated, this is the, the path, then you walk. If it is a long link like this, you walk. If you find a, uh, an area where it is looks like um, a square or circle or whatever space shape you have, it, it actually invites people to to stop a little bit, to think, or at least to slow. They might not stop, but they will slow. So actually having something like this will make people slow. If it is like square like this, people might be tending to slope more than if you make it elongated, something like that. So actually if it is elongated like this, or it is like in a rectangular shape or prism or whatever, then it's more for movement. People will most probably will not stop. So actually, do we, in this case, control the movement of people? We don't, but actually we kind of give the, them a hint that it might be a good thing to, to stop. If it is elongated, we give them a hint that it, is, it might be a good idea to just continue, maybe just slow down a little bit and then continue. So if you are if you're going to this space with this pedestrian walk, I will just go here slow a little bit and then I will decide where I want to go, either here or there, and then I will just go with the same speed again. But I would definitely say, this is a second thing. So first thing, whenever two pedestrian uh, walks meet, you create a space, either a very small space, like a pocket space or a larger plaza or something. And when you select the shape, if it is like a circular or square shape, you, you expect people to stop and think. If it is like elongated in a prism or rectangular shape, people will just continue. Um, but actually the second thing will be, make sure that you, you are not, putting people in a situation where they don't want to, they don't know where to go, right or left. This is a very tough choice. When you have something like this, unless he sees like a big building on this side here and another one here, now he would, he would know where he will be going. But actually, other than that, he's kind of puzzled. Where should he go? When we are doing this, we have different choices 
Everett, what 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 do, what do you think? Uh, we, what do you think we can do to make people really select one road or another, one pedestrian walk or another? What do I think? I can. What do I think? What now? You can make people pick what? How would you direct? Use one direction. One direction. How would I do one direction of a road? Um, I mean, I just put up a one way. I'll, I'll make a no, road. No, no, I, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. Go one, one way. I meant that people like connection or otherwise. How would I connect to a three one way road? Is that what you asked? It's not no, it's not one way. I'm going and coming, but you want, want people when they stop here, they want to feel that connection number one is more important than connection number two. Connection number two. You, uh, you uh, if I think that's what you're asking, I say put up a yield sign saying like on one row you do a yield, and on the other row it'd be like, well, you got city traffic. What, what do you think well, if you, you think if enlarge you the size the of this connection number one? Enlarge. 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 Yeah, I do like a two or three lane where I have I go in the same direction or what, or what have you. And that, and that lane that's not important, that's, now the primary lane will be bigger than the, than the other lane. Because I make it like, well, you got to use a yield sign, basically. That's no, wait, 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 wait. This is not traffic. It's not people. Wait. It's not, it's not traffic. It's people. So actually, if I'm, walking, if I'm coming this way, I would like to actually see that this connection sign is more important. So what I might do is just enlarge a little bit. Like, at 10 feet, we'll continue having the same distance. This would be six feet. So people coming to this connection will imagine that because this is a continuation of the same, this will be more important. Right. Um, right. Yeah, I'll enlarge it. Number one, yeah. number two. Uh, I mean, you put like a uh, something on there to let it be more like a feeling like a main attraction or something like, I don't know, park benches or something on the side of that road to make people understand like, okay, you know, this is where that, you know, on the small Well, road. look, look, what, what you're saying is important here. Because I might, because I might as, as we say, three line pedestrian walk. So actually I have the three line, go ahead all the way. So actually, this continues. If it continues, it tells you that this side is, is important. And have maybe another kind of trees here, small or something, or no trees at all. So actually, when you're walking on this connection and you see this space where you are kind of branching in two directions, now if you see that this is wider or that you have a tree-lined connection while the other doesn't have that, then you are uh, definitely telling the people that this side is more important than the other side, right? Yes, sir, I agree. I might also I add might uh, uh, about the, about the material, material used. So actually, if I'm having tiles here on this side, and I need to continue in that direction, I will use the same tiles. If I want people to go here, even if it is a smaller pedestrian walk, I will use the same material. Like I will use the tiles going this way. So actually, people, in a, I mean, even if this is like six feet only, and this is was ten, but this the kind of tile extends in this direction, people will go in that direction. People would like to see something that they can uh, understand. So actually, they understand that. This is the kind of tiling they're having for me to go on. So if this tiling continues in that direction and I use another kind of tiles in that direction, then the whole thing changes. Now people will go here. These are very little, I mean, small tricks that we use 
to make sure that people really understand our design. Um, sometimes we, don't, we, we even do something like, um, it, that started actually in hospitals where we use color coding. Like if you have like the, um, on the side of the, of the pedestrian walk or inside the corridor, you will have like a, a blue line with uh, a special tile, a special blue, blue tile. And this blue tile will go this way and then it will continue that. So actually you're telling them that if you're following the blue tile, you go this way. On the same road, I will have a blue and a yellow tile. So actually the yellow tile will go here and will continue in that road. So actually this is what we call color coding. So in addition to the width, use of trees, um, color coding, I'm sorry, material selection and then color coding, we can have uh, different ways of telling people where does it continue. So actually if I'm using the, the blue line and I will have a sign saying that blue lines will lead to the, the night building and the yellow line will lead to the quad. So actually people know already if they want to go to the quad, they will follow the yellow line. If they want to go to the night building, they will use the, the blue line. And actually this makes things legible. It's very important when we are having connections on side, on the site to make them legible. What is legible? Uh, Dana, what do you think? What is legible? Hello? Huh? What is legible? What do, what, do, what do you think the word legible means? Accurate? No, legible actually means that understandable. You can, you can, something that you can comprehend. So if you walk on, on campus and see that if you are following this pedestrian walk that is 10 feet, you it takes you to the important places on campus, then you understand it is legible. So whenever you see a 10 foot sidewalk on campus, it means that it leads to important places. This is legible. It makes you understand something out of uh, a visual clue or a visual symbol. Like in, in um, vehicular traffic, some countries in the world, when you are seeing a yellow light on the street, like it's not really white it's not the, the normal white light on the street it's a yellow light it means that this road will connect you to a highway if it is a white white light it means that this is a local and will connect connect you to either a local or arterial road nothing really big so it's either yellow or white with the lights so actually well, yes we can do that too with the with the pedestrian walk i can say that okay if you see this kind of lighting fixture on campus, it means that you are going something local. If you see this larger uh, light on campus, it means that it leads you to something big, like maybe going out of, of campus or connecting to a vehicular traffic or something. <coughs> so actually what we do is use different design details to make what we design legible. It is legible when we can um, make the user understand what does this symbol mean? It might mean if you walk with this ye yellow line or blue line or red line, you are reaching that kind of activity. It might mean that if this a tiled pedestrian walk, it leads to the quad, if it is not tiled and just uh, cast in situ cement or something, it, it will take you to the sports complex. Uh, it might mean that if it is a tree lined street, it, it is a major thing. It's not, if it doesn't have trees, it's not important. It's just local. It leads to places for relaxation. I mean, you can use all of these symbols and finishing materials, lighting, uh, vegetation, uh, height of, the, the light post and things like that to make that whatever you design as legible. Legible meaning that you, you make 
people understand. You make your users understand your design. This makes it legible. Okay, we said something also about not to make this it, it, like what, what we call in traffic the fork ahead. When you have a fork, a fork is, is something like that. At least two connections like that. This is not the best thing to design. We usually avoid doing this. Uh, we try to do something here and uh, space and then make them not equal, like they don't have the same ang angle, I'm sorry. They don't have the same angle. I will have this coming like that and this will be like an 80 degree or I mean 120 degree and this will be like 160 or something. I mean, this is closer to being like an extension of the original and this kind of a branch. But going into a fork where both streets are exactly the same angle is not a good thing to do. We usually don't do that. We, we don't, don't like that. And also when we are doing connections between pedestrian walks, like I have to draw like in here. Let me clear this and try. If I'm having pedestrian walk, something like that happening, another pedestrian walk, then pedestrian walks don't never cross like that, like in, in lines. You have to think about the, the area here. And then there is the vehicular traffic road coming here. Sometimes we do, in, if we, we, we are interested in making this um, pop up, in, in the uh, face of the users to make sure that they, they really take care of this and be careful and be safe. We might enlarge this very much to make it like a big space that covers the whole area with the street crossing, with this pedestrian walk coming in, with this pedestrian walk coming in and, and getting out, something like that. So actually we enlarge this very much and make it legible, make it in, in, in a very clear material like bricks or tiles or whatever. So when we do that, then people start to look around when they come here. So they see that the vehicular traffic road, they see an extension here, they see an extension here and there, and they start thinking about it. Uh, when we do that, <clears throat> It's not really the, uh, the size that will be all used. It's the size that will make you aware of the existence of this intersection. It's not that you design it uh, for uh, people to, to use the whole area, but it, they, they, it will create kind of an awareness. It will create uh, uh, people kind of uh, alert. They, they, they will be alert that when they come here, there's, there's something happening. It's not really the normal uh, connection between two uh, pedestrian walks. This is now a big connection. This, there's something happening. So actually being alert about this makes it even safer. I can do things like, okay, I can do other things like, let me draw another one. If I'm having come here, I can do other, do other things like, okay, so actually they, they connected here and this is coming here. So what I do is kind of enlarge this area in the direction that I think people are gonna like it more. So actually I will make it something like this or maybe make it something like this. Larger than needed in a direction that people will uh, appreciate because it is the connection that they need to go to or I mean, whatever, I can do that. Like extend it in that direction as well. Do spaces need to have a clear shape? They used to tell us in the past that something with a clear shape is actually um, more, I will use the same word again, legible. If you see whatever you see in the street, you come back and say, well, there was this square. It's not a square. I mean, you didn't measure it and you prove that it is a square or a circle or something or a piazza because a piazza is 
in our minds, a piazza is, is a circle thing and a square is a square thing, but most of our urban spaces are not actually shaped purely like that. Is it important to shape it purely? Uh, it makes it more legible, yes, but actually when I see something like this happening in the street and it doesn't have a shape at all, it doesn't have a shape, any known shape, it just comes like that. People will understand it either as a triangle space, or maybe some people will say it's a square again. Um, it, it doesn't matter for them. So actually, yeah, it is kind of to make it more legible, make it like um, a very clear form, or otherwise use any any shape, and people will create their own shape in their mental maps. I would actually stop here and and ask you for Thursday to come early on time because we're using a big map and what we're gonna do is draw on that map the Northern Connection Road. It's a bigger map, so actually we'll have a little bit of space to draw with. Uh, we will use the whole time in our class to, to draw on that, so please come on Thursday on time. Don't come late. I mean, just do whatever is necessary to come on time because we will be using the whole thing. Um, did all of you uh, put their assignments? Anybody didn't? Okay, who, who didn't put the assignment? Last time we said that please do the assignment and post it on site. So all of you did the assignment? Very good, okay. No answer is, is okay, so, right? Uh, Thursday, I'm expecting you to come on time. It will be the Carver Building Room 222, 222. And we will be working uh, from 9.30 to 10.50. So please come on time. This will be the last time before the spring break. So please come in. Any questions? Any suggestions? Hello, Kelly, Anisha. Mm -hmm. Anisha, yes. Come. No, I was saying no. OK. Kelly, Shakila, Everett, Dana, no suggestions? I'm good. No. Okay. I'm good. Okay. okay. Shakila, Dana. Very good. So, okay, we're expect I'm expecting you on Thursday. It will be 9.30 in class, Carver Building, room 222. Please uh, bring in your uh, pens and things and whatever you want to, to use to draw on our, uh, I will provide you with the paper and the map. So please just come in on time. If, if no more questions or anything, I will just say thank you and we are done for, for the day. Thank you. <laughs>